Okay, so we're a bit behind, so we'll try and uh, make up some time with 10-minute uh, presentations. Uh, my presentation is called Community Video as a Tool of Indigenous Resistance, Reimagining, and Decolonization. Uh, some of you who have seen me present in the past will uh, recognize some recurring themes here, and there's some new faces here, so some of this will be new for some of you. Um, I offer this as a presentation, but also as an offering, because I work with Cicada um, as a research associate on the uh, visual methodologies axis. And so a lot of the work that I do is uh, video training in indigenous communities that are facing some form of threats to their territories. And so I would sort of extend this, the work that I'm presenting here as an invitation, if you are working with a community or if you're representing a community that may be interested in these types of uh, initiatives, by all means, please see me afterwards. Resistance, reimagining, and decolonization. I'd like to begin with uh, a thought provocation from Leanne Simpson, who uh, offers that building diverse nation culture-based resurgences means significantly reinvesting in our own ways of being, regenerating our political and intellectual traditions, articulating and living our legal traditions, language learning, ceremonial and spiritual pursuits, creating and using our artistic and performance-based traditions. All of these require us as individuals and collectives to diagnose, interrogate, and eviscerate the insidious nature of conquest, empire, and imperial thought in every aspect of our lives. It requires us to reclaim the very best practices of our traditional cultures, knowledge systems, and life ways in the dynamic, fluid, compassionate, respectful context within which they were originally generated. And I offer that kind of to foreground this brief talk um, by means of saying that um, I would encourage us to consider how visual methodologies might be useful to assist in this um, very uh, specific offering. And from Arthur Escobar, who offers that narratives are always immersed in history and never innocent. So what can we do with technologies that create narratives? What can we do with storytelling technologies? And how can we use them in specific ways, as Simpson has called us to consider? This is Mauricio Machado, who works with the Nobe Bugle community that I've been working with uh, in Western Panama for several years now. He offers that historically our indigenous population suffered in the epoch of co colonial conquistadores who suffered in a war with firearms. Nowadays, we're seeing that the war is maintained against the indigenous population, against the original population, is a psychological war. And by what, that, what he means by that is the inculcation of shame. By th that his in the indigenous youth of his communities are being taught that to be indigenous is shameful. So they come from an area where there's very, no roads. The first road has just gone in. Uh, they travel by, by foot or by canoe. And so they come into the cities and they take off their indigenous attire and put on Adidas clothes and backpacks as a means of uh, feeling a certain shame from where they come from. And where does that come from? Well, he indicates that the educational system in Panama has taught them to, to be successful and wealthy is to aspire towards endless material consumption. And to him, that is just insane. That is not wealth, that's poverty. And so how can his big aspiration is how do I help to inculcate pride in my community, in the youth of my community? And what does video have to offer towards that specific need? So the question that I, can, I offer us to consider is how can video be used by indigenous communities as, amongst other things, a tool to assist in their struggles for the defense of territory, livelihoods, culture, heritage, language, life plans, food sovereignty, in other words, in ongoing struggles related to the recognition of rights, self-determination, self-governance, land, tenure. And I'd argue it can really assist in all of those specific areas. My interest in this began about 10 years ago when I happened to be present at an illegal forced eviction here in uh, eastern Guatemala on Lake Izabal. Five indigenous Mayan Kichi communities were living on territory claimed by a Canadian mining company, were illegally and violently evicted by about a thousand cops and soldiers. Um, I was there with a video camera, there was the public prosecutor reading the eviction notice, and then this proceeded in five communities over two days. And some of the evictions were more peaceful than others. Some became quite violent, in which heavily armed police and militias, the military, oversaw. Uh, is it okay with the translation? Am I going too quickly? 
maybe? Raymond Robotai, are we having problems there? Okay. In which they oversaw the burning down of people's homes. This is a worker who was burning down people's homes in uh, one of the communities in question. Um, and so I posted a video online to contest the version of events offered by the mining company. And the mining company, after this happened, released a press release which stated that everything is great, we're all friends, the, squatters have illegal, this, the illegal squatters have left our land. This was their press release. They thanked the army and the police for being so peaceful and nice throughout the entire action. And so the video served to contest that totally false narrative of what had happened and to um, offer the voice of those who are resisting the evictions on a global scale. And it, a pin dropped for me, right? I thought, I went back, of course, uh, a month later when they reclaimed their land to screen the video on my little laptop, but I thought if only they could have video cameras and the means to do this themselves, thank you. And then I began to do that. So I began to train communities in other places, in Honduras, in El Salvador, and then with, with Cicada subsequently, in, in Panama, in uh, Argentina, uh, last fall in Africa. And amongst other uses, video can be extremely useful for, I only have five minutes left, so I may race through this, but documenting the, the types of things like illegal evictions, exposing the effects of destructive forces the community may be confronting, mining, contamination, very useful to show those images as an educational tool within communities, right? So in where I'm working in Panama, there's no electricity and there's no internet, but they travel around with the equipment that we provided them with and can screen videos amongst the communities. And so it's a form of like inter-community communication device, super useful. Uh, solidar soliciting the solidarity of allies on the international scale, extremely useful. Uh, documenting elders' accounts of traditional practices. We've heard over the past couple days this fear of in traditional knowledge being lost. We heard it this morning, a desire to capture traditional knowledge and pass it on for future generations. Um, past stories of struggles, ter movements, resistance against harmful practices. Um, and getting back to how I began with Leanne Simpson, how can it be used as a tool of decolonization? Well, there is Escobar again. Narratives are always immersed in history, they're never innocent. And his proposal is whether we can unmake dominant discourses like indigenous people are shameful because they live in the forest, right? The narrative that the people in, in Western Panama are being exposed to, that shame that's being uh, inculcated through the educational system, will equally depend upon the social invention of new narratives, new ways of thinking and doing. Although it may not need to be new, it may actually be a recuperation of very old ways of thinking that video can assist with. And so video is a tool of decolonization. It can be used as a language education project, has been brought up in the past couple of days. Language is obviously not a descriptor of reality. L language embodies ways of being and knowing. And so language, is, uh, video is a tool of education of language. Collaborative history projects we're involved in. And in terms of what I've been able to witness, it's pretty inspiring to see these three levels of which it's been functioning in the training workshops that I give. Two minutes, thank you. Uh, technical trainings, of course, you're learning the skills. Through the interviewing process of creating these documentaries and videos, the youth, which is generally the youth, are learning about their histories, which is inspiring to see, which kind of creates this political orientation. Suddenly they feel more inclined to defend something which is more meaningful to them. And so it's functioned as a catalyst in that sense. In my last minute, I'll just offer you some images from trainings we've done through Cicada that I've been able to do. Guatemala with Maya Mom near a gold core mine in the highlands, western highlands of Guatemala. Mapuche indigenous facing fracking in the Campo Maripe in Argentina. Uh, this is most recently some Maasai students uh, and Chepkitali students and also a San member from Botswana and Maasai and Chepkitali from Kenya. These are trainings that I offered in Durban, South Africa a few months ago. Um, and these trainings are sort of ongoing and I know I only have a minute left but the most uh, where we've been able to most dedicate the most amount of time and resources has been in this region of Panama. I think the battery's gonna be dying on this. Uh, in which uh, these people, the Nobe Bugle, inhabit an area that is considered terra nullius by the state. So there's no recognition. The state has just a few months ago declared the entire region will be a national park. And what they've done in previous times, the national park is a reason to evict 
and then often resource concessions are granted within the park. This happened in the national park on their territory, Santa Fe. And so they're using video to announce, these are the video training workshops we've done, they're using it as a tool now of resistance to announce, to, to give lie to that narrative that this land is devoid of people, to say we are here, we are present. So these are some of the tools they've uh, acquired through the Cicada training, we've been able to do screens, projectors, cameras, microphones, all battery powered, solar panels, and they're using these technologies here as a means of, uh, this is the road that just went through the territory, which has opened it up to land speculators, which I don't have time to talk about, and land grabbers. The government, without irony, has called it the conquest of the Atlantic. Those of you who have picked up the Cicada newsletter will see a story about this on page three. Um, and there's a new hydro line going in, this guy is a land grabber himself, which we don't have time to get into. He steals land in the name of conservation, then sells it as luxury real estate. So they're using video technologies as a means of, of revealing what is happening, or they're, they're, they're trying to use it as a leverage of their struggle. I know I'm out of time. Um, I won't cycle back to that. Um, they're also using it, as I was mentioning a moment ago, as a kind of community educational tool. So this is a congresso where they're using the uh, the, the projector and screen to project what's going on in other parts of the territory, but also to record. So here's the camera being used to offer a very powerful, inspiring denunciation of what they're confronting now, these imminent threats they're facing with the declaration of a national park on their territory. Uh, and very, uh, as my closing, closing slide, uh, there's a book coming out this summer uh, edited by Thora Herman and Selfie, um, uh, uh, Thora had to take off, but uh, she was here earlier on Indigenous Cinema's uh, Representations in Movement, that's the English title, uh, and I also have a chapter in there about the work in Panama. So I will leave it to uh, my other panelists. Thank you.